Perfect. Um, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the webinar Get Into WIPO. Um, I will start with uh, introducing the panelists. So um, we are uh, very glad to have today uh, Stephen Viber from IFRIA and Teresa Hackett uh, from Eiffel and also um, Nick Avarta from Education International. Um, thank you very much for joining. We are delighted to have you here. Um, so I will now uh, uh, give the floor to uh, Stephen Weiber for the introduction, and we will uh, move on the slides. Please let me know if you want if I'm if I'm moving the slide on time. Thank you very much. So let, let's move to the, the next slide, um, and and. The goal of this webinar as a whole is to give you an insight into what the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, is, um, what it's doing, uh, why it's important, um, and why IFLA put so much effort into engaging with it. But also, and this is a really important thing, why it should be something that is interesting for you, why it should matter for you, and how you can get involved, how you can support IFLA, how you can support the global library community to be as effective as we possibly can, and we hope help yourselves in your own advocacy work. So just as a, a quick introduction here, so firstly, why copyright? Because I'm conscious that copyright is often seen as a, a technical issue, often an antagonistic issue, an issue that is difficult, that's less easy to explain, that's less easy to engage with. But, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this already, it does matter because as set out on the screen here, it, it is the right, it is a right created by government that gives right holders, and that can be authors, creators, but very often actually the companies that buy or acquire or trade in rights control over how works distributed, copied, used, loaned, or whatever else. It's also something that lasts a long time. Um, international law sets at life 50 years after the death of the author. So this is an expansive right, and it's a long lasting right. It's also an international right. It's a principle under international law that you have to treat works by other people, by people from other countries in the same way as people from your own country. Um, but fortunately, we have exceptions and limitations, and this is going to be a, a big focus here, um, that these are things that mean that the, the extreme extent of copyright in terms of what it covers and the time it's valid for are not as bad as they might be. There are ways for libraries to do their jobs because as it says, as it says here, um, it means it's possible for libraries to lend books some of the time to copy books to carry out their missions without each time having to go to the publisher or to the author and seek permission or to pay for things and this is important because if you can imagine in your daily lives if you needed to seek permission for everything you do every time you lend a book every time you allow someone to take a copy of a couple of pages every time you allow someone to access it remotely then very quickly the work of libraries would become almost impossible the only thing that would be possible is for people to come into the building physically and look at books there. However, and this is one of the reasons why we really engage in WIPO, while the rights are international, exceptions, limitations are not, which means that we're in a situation where there's a lot of imbalance, there's a lot of unevenness between countries. Not all countries, not all library users, not all libraries enjoy the same rights, enjoy the same possibilities. And it's very difficult for them to be sure if they want to work across borders, for example, to supply documents as part of preservation networks in order to support cross-border research. It's very difficult for them to know what is possible and what isn't, which creates a lot of uncertainty. Next slide, please. So just to, that's a lot of text on that one, but just to set out the reason why we, we the reason why this matters so much to put things simply is because in reality, adequate copyright laws are one side of the same coin as adequate funding for libraries. Copyright to the resources you receive, the resources you have are clearly important in terms of being able to build up collections, to buy access. But if you don't have the right copyright laws, 
you're very limited in what you can do with them. The impact you can have is less. And so really for libraries, these two things should go together. Campaigning, advocating for resources, and campaigning, advocating for the possibilities to use these resources to achieve library missions. And that's exactly what copyright is about, and that's what we're about. That's what we're about. So I'm now going to hand back to Camille to offer a little bit more background about WIPO itself. Thank you. Um, so um, what is WIPO and why is it a key area for library advocacy? Um, I'm presenting this different slide. Um, something is missing in the... Ah, yeah. So um, the World Intellectual Property Organization is a United Nations agency with um, 191 member states. The World Intellectual Property Organization has a key role as a forum for the adoption of global instruments on, uh, on inter intellectual property for discussion about law practices and in their impact uh, and, and their impacts and for international intellectual property services. So, the WIPO, uh, so the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO has different uh, uh, area of focus. Um, so it's including uh, patents, uh, trademarks, industrial, industrial design, uh, tradi traditional knowledge, but also for us, as, as of course, I'm sure you, you know, uh, copyright, as my, also my colleague mentioned earlier. And um, so, of course, as libraries, we are uh, focusing on the copyright um, uh, area uh, that, uh, that is developed in, within WIPO. Uh, I think one of the important things that we have to understand about WIPO is that it works through consensus, which means that we need a global agreement within the member states to actually be able to move things forward. So sometimes it can be actually um, taking some some time and effort to get to that. Uh, it's a long process to, to, to succeed to have a consensus within uh, WIPO as within many additional uh, other uh, international agencies, of course. Um, so how does it work? Um, so for the copyright of the copyright, the copyright area, we do have a specific meeting which is which is happening twice a year. Um, this meeting is named the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights, that we also name um, uh, SCCR. Um, as I mentioned, it's meeting uh, twice a year. Um, usually, it's um, around. May, June, July is the first part of the year and October, November, December um, in this area for the second uh, meeting. Of course, with COVID at the moment, things have been a bit disrupted and, um, and it uh, varies a, a, a bit more. Um, and well, when we are, and the question now is who is within this meeting? Uh, who is in the SCCR, the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights. So we have various uh, representatives. We have what we name, we divide it in two pieces, in two, in two communities in a way. We have the Geneva-based delegates. So they are in Geneva all year long, or they are the one that we attend as well, um, the, the SCCR. And they are diplomats or second official, for instance, like first secretary or second secretary or third sec secretary. Um, and we have the capital uh, uh, delegates. And um, uh, those representatives are flying most of the time to Geneva for this meeting um, in order to uh, provide also uh, national or, more, um, uh, of course, maybe more um, yeah, I would say a direct perspective uh, from home, let's say. And those are um, officials on copyright. I mean, we say I, intellectual property office, which uh, is um, also it encompass as well encompasses as well the uh, copyright branch. So they are representative from this IP office. Um, another point is that. Um, what we can receive, what we can expect from the SCCR and WIPO in general is to provide research and guidance um, um, 
in the work we are undertaking. So there are opportunities to actually gather research or guidance from, from the SCCR on copyrights within this SCCR. But we can also expect or hope for international instruments. Um, and obviously, as well, as you can see in the slides, um, they have also the, the possibility to support capacity building, for instance, among different countries, uh, member countries. Um, to continue on how it works, um, within WIPO, we have different groups, and it also includes within the SCCR. Um, the, we, the member states themselves, they are organized in different groups. So we have the Africa groups, we have the Latin America and Caribbean that we also name GRUAC. The Group B, industrious countries, which is also including um, uh, regional subgroups like the European Union, Asia Pacific, Central Asia and Central and Eastern Europe and the Caucasus that we also name CASEC, Central Europe and the Baltic States, CEPS, and China, which is on its own. Um, and we have also what we name observers. Uh, IFLA and EFL and Educational International are part of those observers, which means that we are um, following the discussions and we are part of the debate as we can also um, make um, uh, statements uh, after the after the moment when the delegates uh, spoke. So as I mentioned, we I divided in several groups uh, under your eyes in the slide. So you have IFLA and the library II, so obviously including EFL, Teresa, which is in the in the in the panel in the panel and also uh, information association and institution afria uh, um, uh, we also have global ai's so we have wikimedia communia as i mentioned educational international we, we have nuclear in the panel as well charisma in latin america uh latin, um knowledge ecology international in short, we have many different stakeholders that have common names as libraries, uh, and we are actually working with them to move um, to move forward on on the copyright uh, discussions. We also have other interest groups, uh, as you can see. We have also IPAs, the International Publisher Association, International Federation of Photographic Rights Organization, International Authors Federation, etc. So. How does engaging in WIPO library? I think Stephen, this is yours. Thank you. Yes. So, so you now had a little bit of background about um, <clears throat> WIPO as an organisation, about how it works, and now we're going to get a little bit back again into into the substance of copyright and why this matters, and in particular, why some more detail about why IFLA engages so much, why libraries as a field engage. So can we go to the next slide, please? Yes. Um, so I suppose there are three big overall arguments for doing this and one complete sort of, uh, argument to, to, to rule them all, an argument that brings everything together. The first to set out is the fact that WIPO as an organization is unique. Um, there is no other global forum with the same level of, of transparency, with the same possibility to really get engaged, that would allow us to have the sorts of discussions that we are having about the rules for libraries, those limitations and exceptions that allow libraries, that should allow libraries everywhere to carry out their missions. Um, it's the only organisation where we can engage that can set cross-border rules as well. There are plenty of smaller deals, national, international legislation, there are some regions, there are some trade deals, but WIPO is the one place you go if you want to change things for the entire world. Secondly, it's very interesting because it, at least before COVID, um, created an opportunity to be in a room with a lot of directors of national copyright offices, national intellectual property offices. These sorts of meetings are very helpful in terms of being able to sit down to talk with people in a way that often isn't possible back at home. 
And of course, also we engage because WIPO is an active organization. It doesn't just do research and lawmaking. It also spends a lot of its time supporting capacity building, providing advice to governments, organizing seminars, workshops, and training. So again, we try to get involved because there's the opportunity, hopefully, to influence this, to actually shape the support, to shape the advice that governments are hearing. And of course, overall, why are we doing this? In order to get better laws and frameworks for libraries. And that's, that's yeah, that's, that's why we're there. That's why we engage. Next slide, please. To give a little bit more information. Um, so firstly, as said, WIPO is unique. And this is because we don't believe that work purely at the national level is possible. Now, clearly there's lots of variation. We can see great examples of copyright laws. We can see some pretty terrible examples. In 28 countries, there's no, there's, in 28 countries, there's no example at all because there is no copyright, are no copyright exceptions and limitations. But we're seeing that the status quo is just not good enough. That, for example, something like digital preservation, which should be a no brainer, it should be uncontroversial. So only 30% of countries actually have laws that allow for this. As said earlier, we don't have provision for cross-border working. So it's not, libraries can't be sure that if they are sharing a work with a user in another country, maybe they're breaking copyright law there. If they're working across borders on a preservation project, they can't be sure that they're not breaking copyright law. So national working at the national level is not enough. And also being realistic for lots of countries, copyright laws are not the single most important thing they have on the agenda. There are clearly really important things, education, health, economics, jobs, and so on. And so there's always the risk that maybe even if governments understand that giving better rules for libraries is important, they may not, they may have other priorities. So there's a real value in getting an organization like WIPO to give the impetus to encourage them to move in the right direction. Next slide, please. Arguably, work at WIPO, international action for libraries, is also unfinished business. Already in 2013, the Marrakesh Treaty was agreed by member states, and it already has over 100 countries involved now. This is the treaty that looks to remove unnecessary barriers created by copyright to the creation and sharing of accessible format works for people with print disabilities, so works in Braille, works in DAISY format. And this came into being because it was recognized that there was a problem. Now, international law probably did allow you to pass rules that would allow this sort of copying and sharing domestically, but not enough countries were doing it, and they certainly didn't allow it to happen across borders. But of course, the Marrakesh Treaty is one part of the wider agenda. There is, and this dates from the mid 2000s, there was this focus on the role of exceptions and limitations, not just for people with print disabilities, but also for libraries, archives, museums, also for education and research. So this really is unfinished business. WIPO has shown what it can do, but there is work still to do. Next slide, please. And of course, we would argue that the COVID-19 pandemic has simply has emphasized, has strengthened the cause for act, case for action here. <clears throat> We've seen that with institutions, libraries, archives, museums, schools, universities, research institutes forced to close their door, the only way to continue working is digitally. Yet far too often, the sorts of activities that copyright laws allow within the walls of libraries and of other institutions they don't allow them to take place online. For example, a story time is pretty uncontroversial within a library. It's allowed in, in almost every country, it's allowed. There's no question about whether payments should be made. This is a key part of library work. However, the minute you put this on the internet, suddenly the questions arise. Maybe it isn't a fair use, fair acceptable use. Maybe an exception doesn't apply. Similarly, we're seeing libraries struggling a lot with the non-regulation, with the lack of regulation for e-books and e-lending, leading to extreme the need to pay large amounts of money and deal with really difficult licensing terms. So COVID-19 has shown that laws aren't ready for the sort of digital use. Now, jumping around in the points here, clearly a lot of us now have experienced what it's like to not be able to access the library in person, to not be able to access other institutions in person. But this is a reality for a lot of people anyway. Those who are people who are in, in care homes, 
people who are in prisons, people who live a long way away from libraries, and of course, people with disabilities for whom it may not be easy simply to travel. And so this reality, this failure of copyright laws to allow for digital uses under the same terms as uses within libraries is an issue and something that creates momentum, that creates an argument for change. The other point on this slide is, as I said, it's uncertainty amongst governments. Clearly, there are flexibilities, but simply by saying in international law, you may be able to do this, does not give governments guarantees that they won't be attacked by others. And we see that certainly there are efforts, we've seen against South Africa, for example, by foreign governments to influence the copyright process there, to try and remove provisions that would give libraries greater rights. And so again, the value for, the value for governments of having WIPO saying, no, this is okay, this is absolutely fine, you can do this, is really important. Next slide, please. Um, beyond these really high level things, there are wider arguments that justify why we get involved. And we really start moving towards how we engage you, how you can get involved and how you can benefit from these links with WIPO. Clearly a key one is to make sure that those copyright directors, those heads of copyright office, of IP offices who come to WIPO hear from libraries and they see that we're key stakeholders, that we are we have an interest, that we have a value, that we have a position, that we're not just, um, that the debates about copyright do not end up just being about Google versus the Motion Picture Association of America. There are users involved and libraries can be fantastic advocates for users. There are also opportunities sometimes to engage and attend in national capacity building workshops and debates. Again, the great opportunity to get in front of decision makers, to show why libraries matter. As Camille's mentioned already, it's a great source of research. We definitely recommend that you make use of the Cruz report and we will share links afterwards to those who've registered. The Cruz report, which summarizes copyright reforms and copyright laws around the world. It's a great starting point to understand where you are. And finally, and this relates back to the point that WIPO is a place where you can go and talk to copyright directors and so on. It's a good opportunity for us as well as IFLA to help you to send messages to copyright directors, to copyright officials within WIPO. But also it's an excuse for you every six months to be in contact with your copyright offices. It's an excuse to go to a meeting, to hold a meeting, to have a call, to make sure that you're really connected to the discussions that are happening, that they know you're there, that hopefully they consult you, they listen to you, they pay attention to you. And they give you an opportunity to say, well, what is it that libraries need in order to do their job most effectively? So now I'll hand back to uh, Camille to talk about latest developments at WIPO. Thanks, Ayat. Um, so, um, yes, indeed. Um, thanks, Stephen, for, for all the developments you provided. Um, so what are the latest yeah, developments at WIPO? Um, and I'm trying to move this here. Um, in 2019, WIPO uh, held uh, had uh, three three regional seminars um, all around the world with <coughs> I'm sorry uh, with um, with many um, uh, representative and stakeholders. So um, we had one in Kenya, one in Santo Domingo and one in Singapore. Um, uh, we, we also received uh, the uh, report document that we can share with you on, on the three regional seminars. Um, we also had a conference on the exceptional limitation for libraries, archive, museum, and educational and research, uh, research institution. And in, in 2020, we also welcome a new director general um, of, the, of the organization, which is Darren Tang from the uh, Singapore um, uh, Intellectual Property Office. Um, at the last SCCR, uh, so the last uh, Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights, uh, uh, what we name as well um, SCCR 40 because of the 40th meeting, we also have seen uh, different, uh, uh, we had said, different uh, discussion 
occurred. Um, we have seen the, a proposal of study on the benefits of public lending rights um, that has been proposed by Sierra Leone and supported by Panawa, Panama and Mayawi. And I think Stephen might uh, also uh, add some, some information on it later. Um, obviously, um, IFRA and the Canadian Federation of Library Association and IFRA uh, oppose this proposition uh, by proposing a reframing to integrate um, an, uh, a broad scope, including additional means to support creators. Um, so that's what happened at the last meeting. Um, we would like also to highlight a little bit IFRA's position um, on, on several topics. So the first one in, is Preservation Press. I think uh, Stephen already mentioned that we, we have seen an area of work um, uh, for countries that don't have um, uh, accurate provisions on preservation. So for us, we would see that as a, a, key, a key first step um, to move forward on the preservation uh, uh, discussion uh, as also a response to climate change, as is mentioned. Um, we would like also to uh, move forward on education and research to provide, um, uh, uh, to provide support for uh, libraries and also uh, in, uh, education and research institution. Um, we are also supporting um, the uh, COVID-19 declaration and of course, as I mentioned earlier, we are opposing the public, public lending rights in developing countries and we, we hope that we would be able to uh, um, uh, encourage a, a more honest approach um, of, 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 of the study that has been um, um, uh, brought up. Um, so um, I think what we can uh, dig a bit more is uh, if he has work with uh, archive and museums. Uh, we have been um, since a long time working with ICA, the so International Council of Archives and the International Council of Museums, ICOM, um, uh, to move forward on the preservation that we allow libraries, archives, and museums to make copy of work, of works for preservation purposes. So uh, we already mentioned that we had um, many countries that don't even have provision to cover those those uh, those uses, and and we would like to um, be able to develop um, that aspect within the SCCR. Um, so, um, and we would like to see this uh, preservation um, um, uh, provision, perhaps, uh, um, include cross-border uh, network. And so our main goal would be also to uh, provide access to this work for education and research purposes. And I think now are we at uh, my colleague from Education International, um, Nico Avarta, to introduce um, the second topic. So good morning, everyone, and I'm very happy to be part of this webinar together with libraries. I've heard education and research popping up every several times in, 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 in reference that you made, and I think um, we're working very closely at the global level, but we've also had many um, collaborations between teachers and researchers in the regional seminars and at the national level and we're very happy to have this collaboration um, because there are so many synergies that are um, so important. Um, and just to give you a brief um, introduction, so I work for Education International, I'm a teacher myself and we represent um, teachers and researchers um, around the world, um, education unions. Um, and we work on this topic um, like you as well and with the light with the idea of human rights. Um, so we look at this from from the teacher perspective, of course, we look at the right to education, the right to quality research. And of course, the academic freedom and professional autonomy of teachers so that they have the right to choose and also adapt materials the way they need to to cater for a very diverse um, student body um, and to have access to um, all the data they need to do um, the important research work that helps our societies thrive. Um, 
this is why we engage in these discussions um, and um, our link to libraries, of course, is um, whatever you uh, manage to um, change in terms of laws is beneficial for educators and researchers as well and the other way around. We really um, rely and also benefit from fair copyright for libraries, archives and museums. There are university libraries, of course, there are libraries in schools, um, schools have collaborations with libraries, with museums, and it's all very much interlinked. And that's why it's also so um, important and beneficial for us to collaborate on these issues. And I know if, if any of you are working together with teachers or university um, professors, maybe you can um, make it take a note in the chat so I can see where there are already collaborations. Um, and our objectives at WIPO, I think we work very closely with, uh, with the libraries there as well. So for, also for education and research, we would like to see a treaty in the long run, a normative work similar to the Marrakesh Treaty that really promotes national level reforms and sets minimum standards that uh, not only beneficial at the national level, but also really foster cross-border collaboration and exchange. That's something that's happening at the moment anyways, but there are no um, laws in place that um, like diminish the legal um, gray zones. And of course, on the short term and um, education institutions have been heavily affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, um, as well as that we um, push for a COVID-19 declaration that um, helps governments navigate through this emergency situation and um, to maybe establish emergency provisions, but also ensures that whatever has been possible in the classroom and in the university building is now also possible in an online environment so that teachers can um, read a storybook to their children when they are streaming the lessons from at home and it's not illegal. And these are some of the, the, the things that are very important. What's What has been okay before should be okay now and even more that we are now in an emergency situation and we have to collectively um, really um, find a solution to address the health crisis. The same with text and data mining that also um, in those countries that don't have good laws for um, research um, analysis um, that, um, that this is possible now that we can find solutions um, to what's going on. And our strategies are advocacy work. So at WIPO, we do research. We try to find out what are the challenges for researchers and educators and capacity building and global and regional and national networks. So we're really keen to find out um, if their national reforms are going on, if librarians are interested in working together with teachers and researchers so we can collectively um, defend human rights and, and find um, good ways to um, yeah, reform national level reforms, but also like to have an impact at WIPO because that's only possible if we put pressure um, also at the national level at, at the government representatives. So that's for me, I will stop here. So very happy to be here and hear more from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mikuya. I think it was really an instructive. Um, and now, um, uh, please, Teresa Hackett from FL. Hello, um, and uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks to, uh, thanks to Camille and to Stephen uh, for the invitation to participate uh, this morning in the webinar. And uh, lovely to see you all. Um, so my name is Teresa Hackett. I uh, work with an international NGO called Electronic Information for Libraries, known as IFL, and we work with libraries in developing and transition economy countries to enable access to knowledge. And I manage a program on copyright and libraries. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted to see uh, some of our uh, uh, copyright champions um, here in the audience. Um, we have folk from uh, Lesotho and Malawi and Zimbabwe, some of whom have been to WIPO in Geneva. So really delighted to see you here this morning. Um, and what I'm gonna to talk to you about is a new project um, on contributing to public access policy at WIPO. So Camille, if you wouldn't mind moving on to the next slide, please. So um, this is a new project that started um, in January of this year. It's going to run for three years. Um, it's hosted by the Programme on Information Justice and IP, known as PIDGET, at the American University Washington College of Law. Um, the project has two parts. So the first part is research. So there's good, there, there is a network of um, academic researchers who are going to conduct research on copyright and related issues. 
And through that network, then they will develop some positive policy proposals on access to knowledge and the right to research, including issues um, of, of particular interest and concern to libraries that was mentioned earlier, like preservation and also the sharing of research materials. Um, and then the idea is that this research will then feed into an advocacy network, which will be established uh, uh, globally. So it will be a civil, it, there is a civil society coalition, a network of advocates that will operate at the national level, at the regional level, and then at the international level at WIPO. So as, as was mentioned earlier, all these, um, these, these different uh, 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 levels of engagement interact. So what happens at WIPO matters for what happens in your region, it matters for what happens in your country and the other way around. So what happens in your country also has the potential to feed into this high level international policy making. And the coalition will consist of a whole range of stakeholders, researchers, educators, teachers, libraries, archives, museums, and digital rights activists. And we will raise awareness of the public interest in copyright, and we will engage in education for stakeholders, also providing assistance to your policymakers to explain to them what are the issues for libraries and archives and teachers and researchers. And we will provide technical assistance. So we will maybe help to engage in copyright reforms, providing um, um, uh, some, some uh, information and provide uh, suggestions for how the copyright law might need to be amended. And we will also hope to build the next generation of library copyright advocates um, around the world. So Camille, would you mind moving on to the next slide, please? Oops. Yeah, so we will be organizing ourselves um, into regional groups, a little bit like the regional groups of member states at WIPO. So we will, we will mirror those regional groups, if you like. So there's a group for Africa, which is being coordinated by myself and Dick Kiowa um, from the University of South Carolina. Then we have Asia and the Pacific, uh, the European Union, Latin America, the US um, as well. So um, if you're interested, and I guess as you've attended this webinar, you are interested, which is fantastic. Um, please do get in touch with the coordinator from your region and also co connect with, uh, with IFLA, with Camille, with any questions that you might have. And we'd really be delighted to bring you um, into our, um, our WIPO group and uh, so that we can together really make a difference um, in, in supporting the public interest uh, in copyright policy. So thanks a lot, Camille. So with that, I'm gonna hand back over to you. Thanks a lot, Teresa. Um, I, 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 we are really glad to have you both, um, Teresa and Nikla today. Um, and now I think I can hand the mic to Stephen again. Thank you very much. So um, I just wanted to, to echo a point that Theresa made about the importance of working together uh, between the national, the regional and the international level, because really one of the things that were well, the thing that makes the voice of libraries so potent, so powerful at WIPO is the fact that there are two and a half million of our institutions. There are millions of libraries out there in every town, in every city, in so many villages. There are libraries on the ground that are doing things that are that, that gain or that lose depending on the state of copyright laws. Um, and so this is why, and this is a point we've made a couple of times already in this presentation, this is why it's so interesting, so important to be able to work with you, to be able to engage you, to offer the opportunities that we can for you to increase the impact of your advocacy, because in turn, by doing that, you increase the impact of our advocacy. So next slide, please. So a crucial first thing, there are a number of, of, of steps that hopefully you can take and we will uh, send out links to all of these references um, in a follow up email shortly. So firstly, it's simply 
take the time and if you've listened to this webinar, we have a guide on how to get into WIPO that explains the processes. You can also find out more about your own copyright laws. Many of you, I hope, will have a library association that has a copyright committee. If you don't have one, we very much encourage you to set one up and we can help you in that. Um, this matters because then you can try and mobilize your national library field. A second action is to become a member of our network. And we set up a mailing list so that you can hear what's going on. And of course, people who are in Eiffel partner countries also receive support through Teresa, through Teresa's Copyright and Libraries program. Another step is to identify what, who's in charge, who's taking the decisions, who is influencing the decisions. And again, we can offer support with this. There are useful lists from WIPO. We can give you an idea of who comes to WIPO meetings, if anyone. This helps you find out, well, who are you targeting? Who do you need to convince, both in terms of WIPO positions and in terms of international positions. You can also work and identify with allies, other people who care about access to knowledge, other institutions like education unions, uh, education internationals affiliates, like research organizations, other organizations that care about access to knowledge in order to strengthen your voice, to find friends, to find allies. And then of course, simply being ready to engage it can be very simple from sending a template letter to holding meetings, to coming up with campaigns. So next slide, please. So in concrete terms, um, what we're planning, certainly anyone who joins the mailing list, we will provide you with information and tools so that you can get involved in the preparation for future meetings of the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights. So you can reach out to your copyright offices to tell them what you need them to say in order to support the cause of libraries, archives, museums, education and research. We will also look to follow up at the regional level to help to bring African librarians together, Latin American and Caribbean librarians together in order to explain more about the WIPO process. And then of course, to work with you to hear what, what's important, what's necessary, what's helpful, because you're the ones who understand best the situation on the ground. We will also make those connections with our partners from the archives, museums, education and research world, provide you with opportunities to find out who your interlocutors, your partners could be. We'll provide information about op opportunities, about uh, to engage with WIPO, about events that we're aware of, about sessions, capacity building sessions that we hear about. Again, an opportunity to meet with your own decision makers, but also to learn, to develop. And finally, not mentioned on this list, we will also regularly be keen to call on you to give examples of what is the impact of copyright not working for you? What is the impact of not being able to carry out your missions because of copyright? Or being forced to turn to the market because there's not enough regulation and being forced to pay too much, being forced to disappoint mem your users, to disappoint citizens, to tell them, no, you can't do that because copyright says so. With these stories are really important. They can really actually make what we're saying more real, really show what's going on. So with that, I want to move to the questions and answers slide, the next slide. Um, So I can see there's already one question um, from Rosemary Matarure um, about getting the slide presentations. I, I think we certainly can. I would um, we'll check with Teresa and Nicola to make sure that their slides are okay to be shared, but I think that would be okay. Um, Winston Roberts has asked, um, in addition to advocating directly to WIPO, does IFLA have any luck working with national library associations to advocate to their national copyright authorities? Um, I'm going to turn this one to Camille to talk a little bit about the work that IFLA does. And I think Teresa as well, given that actually I think the bulk of her work, Teresa's work is exactly that. So Camille, do you want to talk a little bit about our work with national associations? Um, yes, of course. Um... Um, so yes, Winston, uh, we we are working with National Libraries Association to advocate for um, national copyright authorities. Um, um, this is actually a big part of 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 what we are doing within IFA in the copyrights. We are supporting our members. Um, uh, 
to to make sure that we can that the governments and and entities that are um, uh, developing implementation on copyright um, uh, uh, of copyright uh, provisions are also uh, hearing the interest and the needs of libraries. So we are closely working with our members. Um, uh, from National Library Association to um, uh, different uh, libraries as well, because it's some 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 libraries also that are not uh, part of the library. I mean, they are part of the library association, but we we are working as much with National Library Association as with libraries as an individual institution as well. So we are trying to provide the best um support as that we can uh, we are working with them we are also um, aiming at supporting their position um so um for us it's really important that national library association as institution are also coming to us to let us know about copyright reforms when they occur because um obviously we are trying to monitor all the copyright reform in the world but it's also uh, we cannot do that without the help of of committed librarians and that um but we i am really available for members that are uh, willing to let us know and that would like to have if we are engaged um at, at their side on their side um to respond to um to consultation on copyright or to provide recommendation on copyright we are also we are very yeah we are really keen to work on 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 that together so um I think most of I think normally you you have my email address and you can always contact me if you see that in your country you have a copyright reform and you would like to have if you are by your side um, we are delighted to engage with you. I see another question. Um, do you have any contact from Turkey such as publisher association, librarian association, or is there any representative from Turkey? Stephen or so we. We haven't had a huge amount of contact from Turkey. We are conscious that there is an effort to promote public lending right there at the moment. And so we would certainly be happy to provide advice, support and guidance to the, the Turkish Librarian Association in, in, in approaching this question, in defining your own position. Um, would note as well, I, I, I'm, and then we'll actually hand back to Teresa to talk about her experiences with success in, in promoting national reforms. I've seen that Dr. Al Shorbaji has mentioned firstly the, the Middle East and North Africa region and we can say that we have fed in on the Lebanese reform. We've been working with the Lebanese Library Association in order to support their reforms but we would be more than happy to go further to work with you and colleagues in order to support progress there. Um, um, and there was you mentioned oh and the other point about developing copyright education in fact we have a, a project that Camille is working on at the moment to develop guidelines for how library associations themselves can develop copyright education education and copyright literacy courses so hopefully we're looking forward to later this year providing you with some practical tools to do just this and Teresa did you want to talk a little bit about your experience of oh yeah emotion. thanks very much sorry to jump in i think i pressed the wrong button on on the on the q and a um but but just to to also to to answer uh, uh winston's question so eiffel winston eiffel works through um library consortia um and uh we we engage with library consortia in our partner countries um where we've we've had uh where, where the we encourage the consortia to engage directly with the national copyright authorities and we have many successful examples including from some of our uh, our, our colleagues here on on this uh, call so for example in Malawi the consortia Maliko a number of years ago um, um, intervened when the new copyright law was being developed in Lesotho um, we worked with the with Lelico the consortium um, and as a result of that work the government of Lesotho uh, ratified the Marrakesh Treaty and now we're we're, we're working, but we're going to seek to um, implement the treaty in, into the national law. And then just this week, 
Um, in Zimbabwe, we've been working with two of our colleagues, including uh, Rosemary and Kathy, who are on the call from the Zimbabwe University Libraries Consortium. And we've just put in a, a, a submission to a copyright, uh, uh, to making comments on the copyright bill. Um, so all of this was really made possible through our local contacts. And I would also like to say that, of course, in, in some countries, in many countries, there is an overlap between the Library Association and the National Library Consortium. And where there is that overlap, we always endeavor to work together with the, National, with the Library Association so that the library community as a whole is working together. Um, and, and so in some countries, the Library Association will be, will be strong and will have, uh, will, have, will have resources. In other countries, the consortium may be the place to start, but we always try to build the capacity um, and work together where that's possible. Thanks a lot. Thanks. I can see another question as well. Um, there has been a mention of almost all regions of the world, including those in WPO or IFA or both. There was no mention of the Middle East or in North Africa, particularly the Arab world. Any progress or news? So I, I, th I think, I think we, we, we we mentioned that we have been working with the um, we have been working with the Lebanese Library Association on the consultation about reforms there. Um, we are very happy, and and we certainly recognise there's there's we see often interest from Egypt, from Tunisia, from Algeria as uh, in in promoting reforms that promote access. Um, we know that often things like collective licensing simply don't work. In the Arab world, and so there's not a there's not a possibility to say license everything. It's almost it's almost all, all the more important to have exceptions and limitations so libraries can carry out their job. But of course, as I said, I think we would very much welcome. Um, do let us know what's important. Do let us know when reforms come up, how we can get involved, and of course, in turn, we will do our best to help you identify interlocutors give you topics to talk about, give you template materials so you can reach out. Uh, thanks. I've seen a, a, a last question. To what extent is copyright implementation and compliance in, in each region of the world? So I, I guess we, we, we cover this very briefly, but we're certainly happy to share more information. The, the answer in a word is uneven. Um, c c copyright laws are, are very uneven. We have a huge amount of, there's a huge difference between the laws in some countries which have very modern flexible laws. We have some countries which have laws that are almost a hundred years old. So this was the case in Myanmar until recently, they were still operating with a copyright law that dated from 1911. Um, in terms of compliance, we're conscious that in a lot of situations, people are not respecting copyright and of course we can't endorse this um, however at the same time when people are, are so desperate that they feel like they need to break copyright laws or when they're so confused about what the laws are or the laws are so out of date that they can't understand how they make sense how they can actually implement them this creates a really big problem for the credibility of copyright even it's not a if a copyright if a copyright law doesn't allow a teacher to teach, if a copyright law doesn't allow a library to lend, there's a big question about how credible that copyright law is. So I think what we're trying to work on here is very much, yes, implementation compliance should be better, but a factor that will improve compliance will be better copyright laws in the first place that are credible for people. Thanks. Um, I've seen another question. Um, so it's um, it's a first remark. So thank you for your invitation. Please, the white boy is responsible for creating the international laws and policy, such as IP and copyright rules that organize digital libraries materials. Could you please share the guidelines to get it as a reference when writing the digital libraries policies? So it. IFLA produces a fair amount of information on broader um, library standards, and these are updated on a regular basis. So um, we'd certainly be happy to send on information about more broadly 
how digital libraries can be organized, how you can select content for digital libraries from, around, uh, from everything that's around there. So certainly we have a wide variety of standards that complement IP laws, that complement the work that we're doing on copyright on IP. And I uh, asked a question from Winston Roberts. Any comment on China? Um, that's a very open question, Winston. <laughs> um, I'm going to take it as being about the most recent copyright reform that they have passed and that went into force in June. It is, it, 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 it's interesting. It's a positive thing. It really does. Um, it does open up a number of interesting possibilities. It's certainly a good thing that makes it clear that activities for libraries, that, that displaying works, that preservation, that search are things that are all possible. Um, clearly, it's almost the case everywhere that there are things that could have gone a little bit further. Certainly, it would have been good to see provisions that would prevent license terms from uh, cancelling out exceptions and limitations. That would have been a, a really helpful thing in there. Um, it would have been good to see wider provisions allowing libraries to remove digital locks that prevent them from carrying out their missions. Current provisions on digital locks don't cover all of the activities of libraries, so hopefully that's something that the government will choose to look at in future. The really interesting thing is that the list of reasons for of potential exceptions is effectively open-ended because it allows the possibility for the government subsequently to define additional exceptions and limitations to copyright. So that is, it's not the same as for fair use, fair dealing clause, but it provides an interesting opportunity to be a bit more flexible rather than having to go back to the original legislation and carry out reforms every, every time that a new technology and new need appears. Thanks a lot. Um, I think we are at the end of our time and we don't have any questions. So I think that's the time to close. So um, thank you very much for everyone joining this webinar. Um, and thank you for the, for, to the panelists for joining uh, and sharing uh, those information with us. Um, some of you are already aware that we have the same seminars this afternoon uh, for another time frame. Um, uh, welcome to join if you if you want, but it would be the same content. Um, that's that. And otherwise, uh, thank you very much. And yet, be in touch. Uh, we will send a follow up email um, to provide additional information soon. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.